Well, good morning, New Hope Fellowship. It's good to be with you guys here in person, and thank you everyone who's joining online. Um, before Pastor comes up, I have one quick announcement for the ladies. The second Tuesday in September, which I believe is September 8th, the ladies are going to open up their Bible study again. Um, they are doing a series called Chasing Vines. Um, if you want to be a part of that, it starts at 10. And if you have any questions, you could see um, Linda Valner or Allison, and they could get you set up with the book and some more details. So with that, Pastor has an announcement for the men. And next Sunday night, we're going to have a men's barbecue. Uh, we're going to have some barbecue ribs. And so Jerry Anderson has a sign-up sheet. We'd like your name down and uh, what you can bring. Maybe you want to bring some something. I don't know, whatever, whatever goes with the barbecue. Anyway, uh, that's next Sunday night, 6 o'clock. And we're going to outline some projects that we need to do on our facility over these next couple of months. And so next Sunday night at uh, 6 o'clock, all the guys you're invited and we'll look forward to seeing you then. Don't forget to sign up because we need to know how much to prepare for. So again, all the men next Sunday night, 6 o'clock for barbecue. And with that, Renell, lead us. Let's stand. Let's worship Jesus, church. nothing good in me you are love you are love on display for all to see you are light you are light when the darkness closes in you are hope you are hope you have covered all my sin you are peace you are peace when my fear is crippling you are true you are true even in my wandering you are joy you are joy you're the reason that i sing you are life you are life in you death is lost its I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world. G 
into your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever oh, I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever because my heart will sing sing it out my heart will sing no other name jesus jesus my heart will sing no other name jesus jesus
thank you this morning the way you watch over us the way you care for us the way that you lead and guide us through other people through your word through, by the Holy Spirit by so many ways Lord you tenderly and lovingly have your hand on every one of us and we thank you so much for that we pray this morning for Dave Wesson pastor that preceded me here and Pray for him as he undergoes treatment for cancer. And Jesus, we pray you lift him up, draw his heart close to you, and give him your peace and healing. And for that, we thank you, God. Thank you for protecting our son, James, this week as an auto accident in England. And thank you that your hand has been on him and continue to uh, just lift him, Lord, and uh, bring healing to his back and neck areas, God. Thank you for your grace there. And Lord, so many that we don't know about, but you do, and every one of us carries something in our heart this morning. So church, would you lift up the name of the person or the situation that's on your heart this morning? Lift it up right now to Jesus. Just speak it out to him and say, Jesus, thank you for taking care of this. Thank you for bringing your healing, bringing your recovery, bringing your purpose, your, your financial provision, whatever it is. Just go ahead and speak that person and that situation to Jesus right now, church. Go ahead, lift him up. Lift them up to the Lord. Say, Lord, thank you for taking care of this. Thank you for ministering to my friend, my family, whatever it is, whoever it is, lift their name right now. And Jesus, we bring all this to you. And we thank you so much that you can hear us. But even more than hearing us, you listen and you act in the most appropriate way. We thank you so much. And we give you our praise, Lord. And would you join me in just lifting your applause to Jesus right now, church? 
Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated, and I want to mention just again, some of you folks came in a little bit late, and uh, you missed the announcements. Uh, ladies, uh, coming up on the 8th of September, renewed Bible study. And then men, next Sunday evening at 6 o'clock, there's going to be a men's barbecue. And so Jerry Anderson, whoever Jerry is right here, has a sign-up sheet. And uh, we'd like to uh, have you join us. So sign up with Jerry today. And we're going to outline some projects we want to complete in our church. Uh, we're going to re, uh, redo the flooring and the entire back section. Uh, there's some exterior and interior projects. I won't bore you with all the details now. But uh, isn't it fun to get some things done? You know, I look at my project list at home, and it's about as long as my arm, and I think, oh, no, but then I start whittling away, and pretty soon that one's done, but then I created another one over here. How about you? You know, same thing for you. Church, they are, this is your church. This is ours, and we're going we're gonna to make it the best that we can be, because one day we're going to be op able to open up everything like we want to and get back to, uh, I don't know what normal would be. Do you? Anybody have an idea what normal is anymore? But uh, anyway, we do want to resume all the ministries and I want to, want it, that the building is absolutely pristine and ready for that when that day comes. And so thank you for your faithfulness. And uh, part of that is your faithfulness is in, in our giving. And so as the ushers will receive the offering as you leave this morning, but online, if you're giving today, we thank you. And you can give through Tithely which is an app that uh, I think it's on the screen for you. And by the way, that's uh, extremely helpful for us and uh, actually easy for you as well. And so I've had people say to me through the years of ministry, well, tithing's not in the New Testament. And I say, yeah, you're right, it's not. You know what is? In Acts chapter 2, it says they gave all. <laughs> so take your pick. You know, <laughs> if you want to be cheap, <laughs> go back to the Old Testament. <laughs> but where did it come from? Where did that idea come from? And you go back to Genesis. And this is before the law of Moses and the laws were instituted, the Ten Commandments. And so giving has never been about requirement and law. But here it is. In Genesis 14, you find the story of Lot who was, uh, he's kind of a squirrely guy. He was Abraham's nephew, and he got into trouble. And these kings captured him, and Abraham rallies his forces and goes after him, and he defeats all these other kings and uh, delivers Lot. And on his way back, an interesting happen, happenstance occurs, and he comes to the kingdom of the king of Salem. Now, this is the first of the first uh, mention of this guy, and his name is Melchizedek. And uh, you know, where did he come from? Well, the New Testament says he has no beginning and no end, meaning that there's no genealogical record. It doesn't mean he was eternal in that sense as God is, but it just there's a significance to the way it states it. And it says that Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the spoils of his battle. Now, he wasn't required to do that, but in his heart, he knew that what God had blessed him with in, in victory in that battle to deliver Lot, he wanted to honor God with the very first part of that treasure, whatever it was. And, you know, in those days, it was gold, silver, jewels, whatever they had. And he gave this king of Salem, which would eventually be Jerusalem, he gave him a tenth of everything. Now, there's no record of where Abraham was told by God or whether someone wrote that down and told him, hey, you need to do this. But you know what I found is when I became a Christian, one of my responses to God was I wanted to give. I wanted to worship. I wanted to, to demonstrate to him something of my heart, my love, my obedience, and you do too, right? I mean, don't you know in, in your heart? And it's not a matter of somebody writing something down and saying, you need to do this. Because if it ever becomes that, it's not what Jesus said, or actually Paul wrote later, I believe Jesus would have said the same thing, but God loves a hilarious giver. A cheerful giver is what the Bible says in my version, but the word hilaros is the Greek word, and it means... Somebody laughing. Somebody having fun. And giving ought to be that. 
And so I want to encourage you. There's a fear in that because we always fear, well, golly, I don't have very much, and if I give away, if I give something away, I won't have any left. Well, that's human thinking. But when we come to Christ, we are liberated from that, and the Holy Spirit begins working in our heart, and we know that when we give, God's blessing on what's left is greater than the amount we had to start with. Can you say, hey, I've experienced that, and I have? You know, there have been wild claims that if you give, God's going to do this, and I don't want to, I don't want to do that because I don't, I don't believe that's correct. But I know what happened in my life last year. My mom died in May, the end of May last year, and we were needing to go back to North Carolina. And uh, we had had some bills, you know. You ever have those come, bills? You ever have those that you go, oh, Lord, the checkbook's looking kind of thin, and we had a project here at church, and I thought, you know, I'm supposed to give to that. And so I wrote a check that was, uh, you know, at the time was more than, you know, but I, I, I just felt God saying, do this, trust me. And before we left, the night before we left on a trip, I was handed a check. And then that morning, I was handed another check, and those two checks plus another amount I got equaled a little over 10, 10 times what I had given. Now, I'm not going to guarantee that for anybody. I won't do that. But I know what God did for me last year, and that took care of our flight and the rental car and all the things that we needed to do on that trip. And I said, Jesus, you are amazing. Thank you so much. Because I was able to go back and enjoy without the stress of how we're going to pay for this. Isn't, that, isn't God good? So I want to encourage you today. Do what Abraham did. Whatever battle you're facing, whatever it is, say, hey, God, I'm going to carve out your part. And I want to trust you and live in that realm of trust. So Jesus, I pray for this church, this congregation. And I pray that you will inspire us to, it's not about giving, it's about loving you more. It's about honoring you with the first fruit of all that you give us. It's about walking in your ways rather than world ways. It's about walking in trust rather than fear. And so let this story out of Genesis 14, the story of Abraham, let that story inspire us, not out of legalism, not out of have to, but out of want to because of our love for you and what you're doing in us and you want to do through us. We give you praise for this in Jesus' name. Would you say amen? amen? Amen. Well, there's no offering song today because, uh, you know, everything's changing like fluid these days, right? We were going to have a service outside, but with the ash falling, uh, it's not, I don't want us to be outside breathing that junk. And so we came inside, air conditioned. Can you say thank God for air conditioning? <laughs> thank you, God. <laughs> no, but anyway, today we start the New Testament. Uh, in January, we started with the Old Testament, and every Sunday, we've uh, combined a couple of books through the way, but we finished the Old Testament last Sunday, and so today, through the end of the year, we're going to be going through the New Testament. And I want to just help you, uh, in your mind, conceptualize how the New Testament is laid out, because many people, they, you know, you read the Bible, but it's, it's a mystery. There's 66 books there, there's 39 in the Old Testament, there's 27 books in the New Testament. And you go, how do these relate to each other? And do they have any, uh, you know, order? Is there, you know, some semblance of the way they're put together that makes sense? Or is it just a jumble? And we, we kind of wonder about these things. And I think it's miraculous the way the Bible has been handed down to us through the centuries. If you go back and read history like uh, William Tyndale or John Huss and some of these men who were absolutely uh, tortured because they dared... Uh, have the Bible reprinted for the common people rather than just a select few, on and on. But I think the Bible is one of the greatest miracles that has ever, ever been done. And uh, Voltaire, they say, a philosopher in England, he said, in a, within a hundred years, the Bible will cease to exist. Well, did you know what? A hundred years later, the Bible Society in England was meeting in the house that Voltaire lived in. I think that's pretty interesting, don't you? God's kind of like, gotcha. 
the New Testament. Okay, the 27 books, and there's uh, 5, 9, 4, and 9, okay? We all know what a, a column looks like. It'd be like this right here. Uh, imagine a Roman column, and there's pillars on either side. There's a foundation, and then there's an arch over the top. And so if you can imagine five on the bottom, nine on the side here, nine on the side here, and then an arch over the top with four, that's the structure in the New Testament. Okay, and you're going, what does this mean? Where are you going with this? Well, if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the book of Acts, they lay the foundation for the rest of the New Testament to be built on. And so those are the books about Jesus and the beginning of the early church. And so you have this five-book foundation. And then on the left side, <clears throat> you have the nine epistles or letters that were written to the Gentile churches. It begins with the book of Romans, and then you have 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and then you have Galatians, and you have Ephesians, and you have Philippians, and then you have Colossians, then you have 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. So it starts with a book of absolute, the best doctrine, the teaching of what it means to live by faith and to walk with God and all the principles laid out in the book of Romans. Phenomenal book. And it builds on that until Thessalonians ends with teaching about the second coming of Christ. Pretty interesting. So over here, so that's five and that's nine. And then you have nine more over here. And these are the Hebrew epistles. And these are written to the Jewish audience primarily, and they start with the book of Hebrews. That's why, um, you know, in the Bible, women don't make coffee, because Hebrews, right? <laughs> ha ha, you got that. <laughs> yuck, yuck, yuck. So anyway, Hebrews, and now you're all going, I'm out of here, I can't send this guy. So you have Hebrews, and then you have First and Second Peter, and then you have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and you have Jude, and uh, who am I missing? Uh, I think that's it, Hebrews. Oh, James, yeah, Hebrews and James, 1st, 2nd John, 1st and 2nd, 3rd Peter, and Jude. And then you have the book of Revelation. So again, you start out with doctrine, which is Hebrews, and you end with the return of Christ. Interesting how those are laid out, huh? So you have the two pillars, nine on each side, Gentile, Hebrew, five in the middle. And over the top, in the middle, are the pastoral epistles, which is first and second, Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. And so those books sort of wrap it up in a sense. They're not in the end, but they're kind of tucked in the middle there between the Gentile and the Hebrew epistles to show how to administrate and uh, lead God's people. So I think it's a pretty neat structure, don't you? how those are, are laid out. And so that's just one idea. There are many, many others that you might look at. But I think it's fun to be able to, in your mind, imagine, okay, where does this book fit? And what is the semblance of it? And you get into the weeds a lot more on that stuff. But I think it's fun. That's the way my brain works. And hopefully that'll be a little bit helpful for you in understanding your Bible just a little bit more. Was that helpful? So take that and uh, maybe two bucks and 50 cents and you buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks or someplace. So the book of Matthew is where we're at today. And I want us to open up Matthew because I think it's one of the funnest books because what's fun for me is the songs. And by the way, Rennell and team, you guys, you nailed it with the songs today that God keeps his promises. Amen? Aren't you glad God keeps his promises for you? I mean, where would we be if God didn't? Oh, we'd be toast. We'd be gone. But in Matthew 1, chapter 1, verse 22 of Matthew, it says this. So all this was done. Would you read this out loud with me? Just speak it out. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, saying, and it goes on and talks about that. Did you know that appears about eight times in the book of Matthew? This was done to fulfill what the prophet said. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Jesus said, and read it with me again, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. 
For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. God keeps his promises. And so we want to look today at Jesus, God's promises fulfilled, because it's in Christ that every promise of God finds its basis, it finds its fulfillment in the person of Jesus. And so a question you might have asked in the recent days is, does anyone keep promises anymore? We have politicians uh, last week and this coming week, and they're going to be on the stages wherever they're at, and they're going to be talking about their, their promises and on and on and on. And, you know, most of us that have been around a while, you go, yeah, heard that one before. Because we're used to it. They announce they're going to do great and mighty things, but we know it doesn't usually take place. And so we're sort of numb to that, if you will. And so we get in businesses and have uh, things happen in business where we're dealing with people, and now uh, we all sign contracts, don't we? We sign agreements because if somebody breaks it, then you can uh, have a recourse because people don't keep all the promises. But God does. He does. We're going to look at that this morning through the book of Matthew. And so I hope that in Christ you've learned that, hey, keeping a promise is vital. And I thank God for my father, who now is with Jesus. But I was looking back and said, you know, my dad never broke a promise to me. Never. I don't remember a time when he told me something and didn't fulfill it. And I think that's a wonderful tribute to my dad. Thank God for him. And I hope that's true of me with my kids. How about you, dads? How about you, moms? How about you, husbands? How about you, wives? Because we depend on each other. We need to be able to trust. A promise is a declaration assuring that a person will or will not do something. It's a vow, something promised. It's an indication of something favorable to, to come, an expectation. But unfortunately, become, we become very accustomed to promises being broken. I want to assure you this morning that God never breaks a promise. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible says this. If we could look at 2 Corinthians 1, 20, it says, For all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him amen to the glory of God through us. Let me read it again. 2 Corinthians 1.20 for all the promises of God in Him, meaning Jesus, are yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. What does that mean? It means that every promise in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation finds its basis and fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Every one of them. And that's a big promise. I mean, that's a big statement because you go, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. How do you... Well... That's what 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20 tells us, that every promise of God finds its basis and fulfillment in Jesus. So how can we know the Bible is God's word? How can we put trust in it? Or is it just another book of man-made writings? There have been documentaries on TV in the last few years that, that discount the Bible's authenticity. There have been people, and if you go on the internet and read things, which we all do from time to time, you say, well, on the internet I read that the Bible is just a collection of writings of men and has, you know, and it goes on and discounts Scripture. But I want to assure you, church, that when we open God's Word, we can have certainty and we can depend on what the Bible says, the promises it makes about who God is, about who Christ is, about God hearing and answering your prayers, about His willingness to forgive you and love you, about heaven, about hell, about every end, uh, every, about the end times and eternity. And how can we be sure? Here's a couple of verses that substantiate it for me. I hope it will for you. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8 says this. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Peter's writing in verse 19, he says, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, 
which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Holy men of old spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? There's a term called verbal plenary. And verbal plenary is is the way that we believe the Bible was given. And that means God gave the word, that's the verbal. And plenary has to do with how it was interpreted by Moses, by uh, David, by King Solomon, by Matthew, by Mark, by Luke, by John, Acts, uh, not Acts, but uh, uh, Luke and then Paul and Peter and James and John and so forth. How did all these people write? It's by the inspiration of God. By the inspiration of God, God gave them, they used their own language, they used their own writing style to communicate and put it down, but God gave it to them. It wasn't because one day they woke up and said, oh, I think I'll write the Bible. I mean, we have... People that have said that, you know, there's some that had visions out by a tree and they wrote down and some religions are formed by people coming up with some really weird claims about some angel speaking to them and giving them this. But the Bible's different. And out of the 40 authors who wrote over a period of 1,500 years, there's continuity. Continuity. There is no disagreement It's an amazing book. It's the promise of God. And so we have these promises that we can, first of all, we can build our lives on. Let me ask you, what are you building your life on? What are people around us today building lives on? Well, we've seen the world come to a screeching halt over these past several months. Normal activity, as we would think of it, has change so dramatically it does almost on a daily basis we want to do this but now we can't and so forth and so on and so a lot of the structure a lot of the things we depended on have been sort of pushed aside have you noticed that a lot of unrest a lot of uncertainty what's going to happen next what's going to happen with the election what's going to happen next year with the stock market what's going to you know all these questions and you know what it really doesn't matter what matters is God is in control of my life. How about you? Some people say God's in control, and I say, well, let's qualify that. If a person's heart is not surrendered to God, is God in control of them? Not until they surrender their heart to Him. I want God to be in control of my life. How about you? And I want him to be in control of my life every day because I know when he's in control, I'm not. And in my life, I've made enough mistakes to where I say, God, I need you to be in control of me. How about you? Anybody raise your hand and say, amen, pastor. I want God to be in control of me. I want him to be in control of my family. I want to be in control of my kids. This week, our son James is in England. He's in the Air Force. And he and a friend were coming back from an event and uh, about an hour and a half riding the car, and uh, they're about a, oh, about a mile from where he lives in a little town called, it wouldn't matter the name, Isleham, but you never heard of it, but a little bitty village. And all of a sudden, this car comes out of nowhere and just rams in the side of their car. And he takes off. And so, my son was the passenger, his, his friend whose car it was, he's tries to go after and catch the guy with the license plate. And the guy slams on brakes in front of them, and so they had to stop, and the guy had a friend who came up behind and rammed them in the rear end. And then the guy in front of him backed up into the front end several times, and the guy in the rear, rear back, or uh, hit them several times in the rear end, and then they hit him in the side again, and then they both took off and disappeared just destroyed the guy's car. It's a BMW M2, if that matters to you. They're nice cars. That car is just shambles. And they think, where did that come from? What's going on? And you think, why? Just mayhem. 
but he's okay, and his friend's okay. I mean, he's lost his car, but, you know, but I thank God, thank you for having your hand on my kid's life. Amen? Amen? What's, what's controlling you? What's, whose hand is on your life? In other words, so the promises that we have are found in God's Word, and it says in first, or 2 Peter 1.19, we have a sure word of prophecy, a, a word that is valid, a word that is alive, a word that is going to last for eternity. What is the Bible? There are a lot of books out there that claim to be this or that. The golfer's Bible. I have a dog Bible at home. My dog doesn't read it. <laughs> but I bought it at Costco when I got my dog to figure out, okay, how do you handle this beast, you know, and they called it a Bible. So the Bible just means, the word Bible means uh, a collection, a collection of books that are regarded as authoritative on a certain subject, like raising an animal or playing golf or some other activity. But no, more, no other book is more authoritative than the Bible on the topic of the Christian faith, on the faith that you and I hold dear. And where do we get the knowledge of God? Where do we understand how to live? Where do we understand about Jesus and his death and resurrection? Where do we understand about the Holy Spirit and his coming and what he wants to do in our lives and the gifts he wants to give us, how he wants to use us, how he wants us to function as a church, how he wants us to do missions, and on and on and on. How do we know all this? It's only through God's word. And he gives it to us. So the 66 books divided into two sections written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years that's come down to us and we can take it to the bank. So when I say Bible, I'm talking about these books, not some other books. How can I know that God keeps his promises? It's because of what Jesus has done and that's what Matthew's telling us. In all, there are 333 prophecies in the Bible that directly relate to Jesus. And every one of them was fulfilled. Now, if one prophecy was spoken by George Washington about our current president 200 years ago, would that be a phenomenal thing? I mean, would you say, oh my gosh, George Washington gave this prophecy that in 2020 this person would be president of the United States. Is that fun? You'd go, wow. Well, imagine 333 prophecies given over a period of probably 1,500 years, and they all find fulfillment in the person of Jesus. The number of atoms in the universe, the number that is ascribed to that number of atoms, is one with 84 zeros after it. Now, I don't know what that number is called. I, I don't. Maybe you do. But can you imagine a number with 84 zeros after it? A thousand is a one with three zeros. A million is what? Six zeros after a one? A billion would be nine zeros. A trillion would be like 12 zeros, right? And after that, I have no idea. But 84 zeros? Is that crazy? And that's the number of atoms in the universe. And so the chance that Jesus fulfilled the major Old Testament prophecies about him, his ministry, his life, his coming, and so forth, is one with 484 zeros after it. 484 zeros. Folks, that's a lot of numbers. And what it means is it's almost mathematically impossible that Jesus is not the Son of God, your Savior, who is eternal, that he is in fact God. Amen? God's promises, number two, have been given by the Spirit of God, not by the will of man. That's what Peter wrote. They were given by revelation. My grandpa told me one time, he was an old Baptist preacher, and I, I loved sitting with him, and he would open up the Bible, and 
teach me things. And we listen to J. Vernon McGee on the radio together sometimes. If anybody ever heard J. Vernon McGee, you know, he's a Bible teacher from way back. And I just used to love to, to get that. My granddad told me this. He said, he said, son, there's no new revelation, but there's inspiration on the revelation. And what did Grandpa meant was the same thing Dr. Duffield taught me in college. He said, if it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. What, is it? what does that mean? What God has given is what he's given. And if somebody comes and says, oh, I have a new revelation. God's given me a new revelation. I go, eh, tilt, 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 wait a minute. There's a way that God opens our eyes to what he's already given. But this is the revelation right here. Amen? And I'm suspect of anybody going around saying, I'm a, I'm a this or I'm a that and whatever. I go, hey, wait a minute. Who's your pastor? Where do you fellowship? What authority are you under? Who do you hold an accountability to your life? Or who holds accountability over your life? And if there's not a good answer to those questions, I say, you know what? We, we, need, we got a problem here. Revelation is what we've been given through the Word of God. Matthew 1, 22 and 23. And I'd like you to turn there. I want to read these with you just for a moment. Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Says this. And she will bring forth a son. This is about the birth of Jesus. And she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which is spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying behold the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which is translated God with us. Similar passages in Matthew 2 verse 5 and 6. And so they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, For thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, and not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Twice there the prophet had said, and it's fulfilled. Again, in 2, 17 and 18, if you read there, uh, Thus or then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. This is about the slaughter of the innocent children around the birth of Jesus, where the king was trying to eliminate the birth of our Savior. And 2.23 again says, and he came and dwelt in the city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. And then finally, in chapter 3, verse 3, it says, for thus it was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And there are others. But can you see how God has woven in the story through Matthew, how precise the Bible is? how precise he is in fulfilling what he said. What's, why is that important to me? Why should it be important to us? It's because God constantly prompts us with things. Doesn't he? Doesn't he prompt you? You're going through the day and something of a scripture, something of a pastor's sermon, something of a Bible you read will come back to your mind. And I know the Holy Spirit takes those and he, he drops them in. And he reminds us from time to time. And it's the way God is reminding us, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to fulfill this. I want you to believe me for this. I want you to trust me here. I want you to let me guide you here. On and on and on. He's that shepherd that has his hand on us, helping us through life. And the reason that's so important is we can always trust what the Lord says. Amen? Can't trust much else. We can always trust Him. So Matthew's message is, gives us great hope and confidence. And so Matthew is telling us that just as Mary and Joseph struggled with a promise from God in a very difficult season of life, can you imagine Joseph, his beloved fiancé, what 
You're pregnant? Are you kidding me? Who is it? You know, and I mean, you can imagine the rage and the frustration and all this. Joseph, in, by Jewish law, he could have had her stoned. And I don't mean with drugs. I mean with rocks. I mean, he could have had her wiped out legally. But what did he do? He trusted the word of the Lord. That that which is conceived in her, Joseph, is of the Holy Spirit. And he trusted God. And our Savior was born. Because Joseph had a relationship with God. And he trusted his word. So we can trust God's voice in troubled times. Matthew chapter uh, 1 verse 18 and through 20 where is the story there about the angel speaking. And that references... King Ahaz, back in the Old Testament, Isaiah's day, where the king, he was facing a ferocious battle. He didn't know what to do. And God spoke to him, a virgin shall be with child, and so forth. And that prophecy given to Ahaz had a double meaning, not only for his day, but it was fulfilled fully in the person of Jesus. So let me ask you, what are you afraid of? What's rocked your cradle? What's rocked your boat, or however you want to describe it? COVID-19, homeschooling kids when you're not prepared to teach them and yet now you've been given a boatload of material and you have to sit in front of a computer with your child and they'd rather be out playing. How about layoffs from work? How about finances being cut in half? Sickness, friends, you get a phone call, somebody I know has COVID. I think they're going to be okay. But all this and more. So what storm is happening for you? And in the midst of that storm, where can you trust? What can you go to? What can you hold on to? In church, I believe we can stand on the promise of God instead of our own understanding. My Bible says, lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways, and He will direct your paths. Have you ever read that? Proverbs chapter 3? Yeah. That verse is very precious to me. We were sitting in my bedroom in North Carolina in 1984 at Christmas time. Went back to visit my folks. Alice and I are there. We were youth pastors down in L.A., a church called Angelus Temple. Been there on staff for about two years. And I was beginning to feel unrest in my heart. You know that feeling where you feel like, hey, something's changing, I'm not sure. So I began praying. And I remember sitting on my bed, which used to be my bed, wasn't anymore, but used to be my bed, my old bedroom. And I said, God, I need a word. You ever ask God for a word? Do it. Do it. You say, God, I need a word. And immediately, if since the Holy Spirit said, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. So I opened up my Bible. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways and He will direct your paths. I said, okay, thank you, God. Six months later, we were renting a U-Haul and coming to Shingle Springs. I didn't know that was going to happen. God did. But I knew something was going to happen, but I didn't know what. I didn't know what to do. And that gave me the ability to trust over the next couple months as things begin to shift and change. So you may be in a season right now where you're wondering, God, what's going on? I can't put my finger on it. Something's happening. And I would challenge you. Go to prayer. Say, God, give me a word. And he will. It might not be instantaneously. But I do believe when you open up the Bible, God will guide you and he will speak to you. Why wouldn't he? He loves you. And he wants you to succeed. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11 through 19. It's lengthy, but I I do want you to have this. Hebrews 6 gives us the assurance of why we can trust and what I'm telling you today about God's word. Let's read it. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those 
who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now, Abraham didn't have any children yet when this was spoken to him, okay? For men, indeed, swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of, what? Promise, that's you. The immutability, that means... Immutable means it never will change. Never. The the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable or unchanging things in which it is impossible, say it with me, for it is impossible for God to lie. We have made, or we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. Now, everyone that has a boat knows when an anchor goes in and it digs in, that's the security, and it says it digs into the veil, which was where the Holy of Holies was. Digs in. It's tight. What does that mean? Anybody ever been to court? Hopefully not. But you've watched Law and Order or Perry Mason or some show on TV, and what do they always say when the person gets up on the witness stand? They say, do you put your hand on the Bible, right? Do they still do that? I don't know. I haven't been to court in a long time. They put your hand on the Bible and you say, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you? God. Why do they do that? I mean, why don't they just say, Michelle, are you going to tell the truth? And you would say, yeah. Okay, great, come on up. No, they don't do that. Why? Because they don't trust you to tell the truth. So they give you a Bible to put your hand on, and they say, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, to so help you, God, something like that. And you say, I do, and then they believe you. Maybe. That's what Hebrews is saying. That God not only spoke, but he swore by an oath, which is by his own name. He said, you can go to the bank on what I'm telling you. It will never change for now and all eternity. God's oath, his covenant are absolute and sure. What are some of the promises Jesus has given? I'm almost done. And you're going, oh, thank God. My roast is going to burn if I don't get out of here. Do people still do that? <laughs> I grew up in the South. You know, if church wasn't out at immediately 12 o'clock, you know, people started heading for the door because they had to go home and check the chicken or something. Some of the promises, I will never leave you or forsake you. Anyone need that one today? How about I will send you another comforter, the Holy Spirit, and he will be with you always Number three, if I go away, I will come again that where you may be also, Jesus is saying to the disciples and to us, he says, hey, I'm going to take care of you. You shall be endued with power from on high. The Holy Spirit's going to come and fill your life with his plan and purpose. If any of you are sick, let him call the elders of the church. They'll anoint, they'll lay hands on them and God will bring healing. Is that a promise someone needs today? My peace I give to you, not as the world gives peace. Jesus said, maybe that's your promise. And I love this from John 6, 37. All the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast aside. God says, I will never cast you aside. Oh, is that good news, church? So Michelle's going to help me. There's a song that I haven't sung in a long time. And... uh, Some of you have never heard it before. Some of you have heard it many, many times in your life. It's called Standing on the Promises. 
And uh, it'd be great if we had a, a pianist that uh, played, you know, in the uh, southern style or whatever style. But anyway, that doesn't matter. You're going you're gonna to be the choir. You're going to be the orchestra. And I want you to stand with me. And we want to sing this as an anthem to remember this sermon by and to remember what God has said by. Because I believe you can stand on the promises of God. Matthew's book tells us that. And so as soon as everybody gets a sheet... Uh, how many of you say, I never heard this song before? Anybody say, okay, several of you, you younger folk, we're going we're gonna to learn you a song today. We're going to teach it to you. We're going to help you out. And so you at home, if you don't have it, uh, join in with us. You'll have fun with it. Standing on the promises. Everybody got a copy? Almost. Here we go. And could we have the house lights, please? Here we go. Now you can see more. There you go. Perfect. Okay. All right. Here we go. Everybody ready? Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Now, before we go to the next verse, I want to hear some parts, okay? So some of you sing bass, some of you sing tenor, some baritone, some alto, some... Come on, their notes are here, that's why I gave you this. You can sing it, let's, let's be that anthem, that choir. So number two... Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God. Verse 3. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Verse 4, standing on the promises, I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. There you go. Give yourself a hand. You did great. <laughs> Isn't it a fun song? Well, it's an oldie but a goodie, and I hope it inspires you to trust the promises of God. Let me pray for you. Jesus, as we bow our hearts and our heads and just lift up our hands to you, we love you so much. We thank you for your word that never, 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 never fails. Thank you that your promises are certain, even more certain than the sun rising every morning, even more certain than the moon at night. No promise on earth will ever compare to you and what you've spoken to us. And I pray for every one of us this morning, God, that the things we need to hear from you will be that clarity, that voice that transcends and pushes through all the muddle and all the chaos of life that's going on right now. And we will draw near and hear the voice of our Savior, our Lord, our Shepherd, you, Lord Jesus, that you speak to us of your love and your grace, your provision, your protection. How you're going to care for us, love us, and guide us. We trust you. And thank you, God, for each one here this morning. I know that some are facing enormous battles and situations. And I pray, God, your peace, 
I pray your blessing. I pray your provision for every family, every person here. And whatever situation there is that's causing sleeplessness or unrest, bring your peace now, we ask in the name of Jesus. Bring your clarity to those situations where there's confusion. Lord, cut through the chatter and, and speak a clear word to each and every one of us about your direction, your guidance for our lives as we trust you and live for you. I thank you for these men, for these women, for these young people. And I pray your greatest blessing on them in this day, on this day, and in this season ahead. And for that, we give you thanks and praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. amen. God bless you, church. If you need prayer for any reason, we have a prayer team that will stay and pray for you. Otherwise, God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday. Men, don't forget to sign up. Jerry Anderson has the sign-up sheet. Please see him before you leave. God bless you.